Okay. Um, hey guys, we are going to talk about your unit one material. So unit one was all about ecosystems. We talked about the movement of energy throughout those ecosystems. And we also talked about the movement of matter. So talking about things like the biogeochemical cycles, um, that would be the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, uh, all of that stuff. So there is quite a bit of vocabulary that goes along with this unit, and you will want to be following along with some of that vocabulary in Quizlet during the week and making sure that you are comfortable with those terms. So we're going to start by talking about the movement of energy. This goes most closely with module six in your textbook. Definitely recommend checking that out, especially if you were not here when we went over uh, this unit. That would be pretty important. Um, so we'll be talking about a few topics as part of this module, like you can see there. These topics also line up with an assignment that you'll be working on on GoFormative.com this week. Okay, so most of this should be kind of pretty easy review for you, hopefully, since we've been coming back to a lot of these topics throughout the school year. Uh, but you should be able to describe food chains and food webs, understand the different levels of uh, trophic levels and what types of members we have in those different trophic levels. You should be able to explain how solar energy is acquired and transferred. You should be able to explain how energy flows and matter cycles and kind of some of the main pieces of movement for that those things. And you should be able to determine how the energy decreases as it flows through ecosystems. So starting off here, we are looking at food chains and food webs. Just remember that a food web is basically just a bunch of food chains put together. And so sometimes like we'll look at food chains and look at the interactions between a few organisms but we know that in real life, everything's a lot more complex in real ecosystems, which is why um, we look at these more complex ecosystems here and the more complex food webs that we have. So a food web shows the interlocking pattern of these food chains. Positive and negative feedback loops can each play a role in food webs. So when one species is removed, the rest of the food web and ecosystem can be affected. So for example, if we had a horrible drought and maybe there was no grass available whatsoever in this particular desert biome, uh, the grasshopper might become more dependent on this cactus here since that's um, another form of food that it also eats. And so you know, with that dependency on the cactus, maybe more of those cactuses will be eaten, a decrease in that population perhaps. Um, maybe on the other hand, eventually the grasshopper population decreases. Maybe there is not enough cactus left for the entire population because they're so reliant on the cactus. And so this population could decrease and potentially cause a decrease in the lizard as well. Okay, because of the different food sources that interact with each other. Uh, these are just some basic vocabulary terms you should be familiar with. So a consumer is an organism that is incapable of photosynthesis. Uh, that means it's heterotroph, another word for a consumer, it does not do photosynthesis. An herbivore is a consumer that eats producers, so something that eats plants. Remember that plants are those producers. A carnivore is a consumer that eats other consumers. A secondary consumer is a carnivore that eats primary consumers. And so we can move forward from there and call the next level of consumers a tertiary consumer. And that would just be a carnivore that eats those secondary consumers. So just up a level from um, the secondary consumer there. 
energy captured by producers, by those plants, moves through many trophic levels. It's a key thing we need to understand here. So these plants are special because they are responsible for taking in that sunlight and they perform photosynthesis. And so all ecosystems depend on the constant inflow of that energy from the producers. Producers are able to take all a bunch of that energy from the sun, not all of it, of course, but a bunch of that energy from the sun, and then they're able to pass that on through those um, through those different trophic levels. So above the producers here, we would have the primary consumers, something like a zebra, then our secondary consumers, something like a lion. In some ecosystems, you may have a tertiary consumer, depending on the interactions you're looking at. But if we were looking at this food chain on the left here, there's nothing that eats the lion. So that would be just a secondary consumer in that ecosystem. Okay, so you may remember these terms here uh, related to primary productivity. We talked about gross primary productivity and net primary productivity. And so um, there was a tiny, tiny bit of math that we did with these, like super simple math. Um, but we should know that primary productivity is the rate at which solar energy or sunlight is converted into organic compounds via photosynthesis over time. Okay, so that solar energy being converted into organic compounds through photosynthesis, that just means that solar energy is turned into things like glucose during photosynthesis. Glucose, the formula for that is C6H12O6. Anything that has C in there or carbon is considered an organic compound. The gross primary productivity or GPP is the total amount of sunlight or solar energy that producers in an ecosystem capture through photosynthesis. The net primary productivity uh, was what we were doing a little bit of math to calculate. So the net primary productivity is the energy captured by producers in an ecosystem minus the energy producers respire. Okay, so we have that gross primary productivity minus the respiration rate is how we calculate that net primary productivity. And there are some examples of that in your textbook as well that you can um, look back on if you want some additional review for that. Okay, so be familiar with just the basic idea of photosynthesis and respiration. You should know Obviously, that photosynthesis takes sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and produces that glucose and oxygen. Uh, respiration is the opposite of that. So we take um, water and we take carbon dioxide and we um, – sorry, I read that wrong. We, <laughs> we take oxygen and we take um, glucose and we produce – water and carbon dioxide and energy. And for respiration down here, that energy is in the form of ATP energy, which is that energy that living organisms use to live, grow, you know, reproduce. All of our processes basically use up some of that ATP energy. This is a map here showing the primary productivity um, within the United States during a period um, between March 26th and April 10th of the year 2000. And so I want you to just keep a couple of things in mind because I'm um, talking about primary productivity. We're talking about basically the productivity of plants. Okay, so the productivity of our producers. So the productivity is measured in units of energy per unit area per unit of time. That sounds like, what on earth does that mean? But they basically are just saying here that like we would measure this in K calories per meter squared per year. Or for example, in this map that we see here, um, let's see, it looks like their unit of measurement here is on the right-hand side, they're measuring per meter squared, and they're measuring 
per this 16 day period here. Um, and so something you could keep in mind here is that we see that areas in the south and areas on the coast here, like in California, they are tending to have a higher primary productivity during this time of year. Think about why that might be happening. So in this um, area, kind of in the central part of the United States, it tends to be a lot colder between March 26th and April 10th. And a lot of these areas, they might still be even covered in snow. And so at that point, they have a very low primary productivity because they don't have a lot of plant life growing during that particular time of year, which is why we see in California where we tend to have much milder winters. And in the south here, you know, Florida and Louisiana and some of these states over here, um, they also tend to have more mild winters. And so their primary productivity, even though this is early springtime here, is much higher than some of these other areas. So when we are talking about um, primary productivity and we're talking about producers, it's important to keep in mind uh, just the idea of energy flow and the 10% rule. The 10% rule just means that only about 10% of energy transfers from one level to the next in an energy pyramid. And so we have the producers here on the bottom. Let's say they have 10,000 joules of energy. If we moved on up to the next level in the um, energy pyramid, those primary consumers only receive about 1,000 joules of energy from the level below. And so that's because 1,000 joules is about 10%, well, is 10% of 10,000, okay? And if you were here when we did that lab where we were growing the butterflies, we kind of saw that uh, in nature, when we're talking about like actual living animals, it's not always exactly 10% that is flowing between producers and primary consumers. You know, in, in the wild, maybe the primary consumers are getting 8% uh, in this particular ecosystem or 9% or something like that. So in real life, the amount of energy that a primary consumer gets from a producer might not be exactly 10%, but we just round this to 10%. We call it the 10% rule when we're studying ecosystems. Because in general, only about 10% of energy moves forward to the next level. Um, that's because, you know, energy is moving through those different trophic levels and some of it's lost maybe to the environment as heat or used up in different processes. And so, um, an animal can't officially, efficiently take up all of the energy that the producers were able to get from the sun. Some of that energy is used up in like metabolic processes and things like that. Ecological efficiency is the proportion of consumed energy that can be passed from one trophic level to another. So be familiar with that term. Some ecosystems may be more efficient than others. Moving on to the next big topic we talked about during this unit, the movement of matter. This mostly comes from module seven in your text. So be familiar with the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, and the water cycle. This also corresponds with your goformative.com assignment for the week. So you should be able to explain the steps and the main reservoir interactions with each of these different cycles. So be able to explain, for example, you know, where we get carbon, where we get nitrogen, how it moves. Does it move through air? Does it move through rocks? Does it move through, how are we having these different elements move through the world? How is this matter moving through different ecosystems? Starting off with the carbon cycle, uh, movement of carbon and um, carbon atoms and molecules throughout the world. And so 
Some of the reservoirs in which carbon compounds occur in the carbon cycle hold those compounds for long periods of time, while some hold them for relatively short periods of time. And so you can see here some of the main parts maybe of the carbon cycle. So for example, combustion, we know that that adds carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. That's a movement of carbon. Volcanoes, carbon dioxide, respiration, carbon dioxide. We've talked a lot about carbon dioxide this year. So I think the carbon cycle is probably one of the easier ones to maybe understand and kind of remember. Um, the ocean is a major, major um, carbon sink. So lots of carbon found in the ocean. Remember, the ocean is taking up... Uh, like roughly 75% of the world's surface. And so that's a major movement of carbon. We have respiration happening there. We have photosynthesis. Um, and so it's a major source of carbon that moves through the carbon cycle. So carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and carbon dioxide dissolved in water are constantly being exchanged. Photosynthesis and cellular respiration are both two uh, pretty big processes in the movement of carbon. So, um, because of course, photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide and cellular respiration produces carbon dioxide. So it's kind of a cyclical sort of thing, moving that carbon. Plant and animal decomposition have led to the storage of carbon over millions of years. So if we think about coal, like we see in the picture on the previous slide, we have these fossil fuels here under the Earth's surface. And so um, over time, that carbon can be buried, basically becomes preserved, stored, and so it might be under the Earth's surface, but once we mine that out and we start burning it, we're adding that carbon that was kind of trapped under the surface of the Earth into the atmosphere. So that carbon is moving from underground into the atmosphere, part of the cycling of carbon there. Next one is the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen cycle is the movement of atoms and molecules containing the element nitrogen, obviously, um, between different sources and sinks. Most of the reservoirs in which nitrogen compounds occur in the nitrogen cycle hold these compounds for relatively short periods of time. That's something to remember. So we talked about how in the carbon cycle, um, sometimes carbon is held for a long period of time. For example, when fossil fuels are being built underground, it's a long-term sort of thing, but sometimes it's short-term as well. Photosynthesis, respiration, those things are always occurring. Whereas when we look at the nitrogen cycle, nitrogen always kind of tends to be held for a pretty short period of time. So it's always moving pretty quickly here. Something to remember is that nitrogen actually makes up 78% of the air on Earth. So we always say we breathe oxygen, but the truth is a huge portion of our air is actually made up of nitrogen. And so the atmosphere is a big part of the nitrogen cycle um, as well because of that. So a big thing to remember when it comes to the nitrogen cycle is we have these really cool nitrogen-fixing bacteria underground and so basically those um, nitrogen fixing bacteria they kind of work with hydrogen and um, cause this nitrogen to kind of be converted between like nitrogen dioxide and ammonia which is NH4 and so um, that basically helps the nitrogen to be taken up by plants and so we have some of this nitrogen that is found in the soil. These bacteria kind of change the nitrogen chemically, combine it with different things, and then that allows it to be taken up by plants. And so um, that's where you see a simul simulation here up on your diagram there. And so plants use that nitrogen 
it's an important thing that helps them grow. And then we also have this denitrif denitrification process that happens as well that's going to release some of that nitrogen back into the air. So it's a continuous sort of process. Um, nitrogen ends up in plants like you see in this bottom diagram here. And then we have the plants being consumed by animals. And then through those different processes, nitrogen is kind of constantly changing form between some of these different um, molecules. Another image here of the nitrogen cycle. This is actually from your textbook, so you can look at module seven a little bit closer if you want some extra review of the nitrogen cycle. So nitrogen fixation is the process in which atmospheric nitrogen is converted into a form of nitrogen, primarily ammonia that is available for uptake by plants and can be synthesized into plant tissue. Um, this is a really cool video here about basically nitrogen fixation and how it allows us to grow food. I'm not going to play it right here right now, but I will have a link to this slideshow posted and you're definitely welcome to take a look at it. I recommend um, you take a look at it because I think that the nitrogen cycle can be one of the more uh, complex cycles between the four different um, biogeochemical cycles that we're focusing on. Okay, next one is the phosphorus cycle. Big idea for the phosphorus cycle is basically phosphorus is not exchanged through the air. So the carbon cycle, we have carbon moving through the atmosphere. Obviously, we talk about that all the time. Nitrogen cycle also nitrogen moving in the atmosphere. Phosphorus cycle, we do not have phosphorus moving through the atmosphere. The major reservoir of phosphorus in the phosphorus cycle is actually sedimentary rock. You can see in this diagram here, we have um, phosphate rocks, phosphate mining. We have over time like weathering and runoff that occurs. And so the phosphorus that is in those rocks can actually end up in um, water because of just weathering and erosion and runoff, stuff like that. And so um, phosphorus can move that way into water and into soil, but the main reservoir of phosphorus is sedimentary rock. So that is what sets the phosphorus cycle away from the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. The idea that it's coming from rock, it's going in soils, it's going in waters, not into the atmosphere. Um, so there's no atmospheric component in the phosphorus cycle and the limitations this imposes on the return of phosphorus from the ocean to land make phosphorus naturally scarce in aquatic and many terrestrial ecosystems. In undisturbed ecosystems, phosphorus is the limiting factor in biological systems. So that means that phosphorus is an element that a lot of times there's not enough of. It's something that is required by plants. Plants need phosphorus to grow. Um, just like you need different vitamins and minerals. And so if there is not enough phosphorus, it can be considered a limiting factor. Remember that a limiting factor is something that limits population growth, controls population growth, or stops that growth from occurring because there's not enough of something for it to move to the next, next stage. Okay, next one is the water cycle. I think this is the easiest one. It's one you've probably talked about even in elementary school a little bit. Um, water cycle is powered by the sun. Okay, and so water is going to move through different phases due to the sun's activity. Um, so, you know, the water is going to get heated by the sun. Okay, if we think about ocean, for example, a huge part of the water in the world. Water gets heated by the sun. 
and that solar heating is going to cause evaporation to occur. So evaporation when we have the water turning from a liquid to a gas. Evaporation also occurs in plants. We just give it a special name and that's called transpiration. So when water is released from plants during photosynthesis, kind of like the plants are sweating, that water goes from a liquid to a gas. Evaporation can also occur from soil when moisture is drying out from soil. That evaporation all collects and it goes up in the sky, makes clouds. So next stage would be condensation. It's just like when you have a um, icy cold, you know, drink and then the outside of the glass is warmer than the inside. You get those little water droplets on the outside. That's condensation happening. And then when the clouds collect enough water vapor, they get heavy enough, then precipitation occurs. Basically, the, the uh, condensation starts forming precipitation, starts turning back into a liquid form, and the water droplets fall. Um, precipitation, plants can take that water up, and the cycle just continues. And then we can also have water, you know, flowing into groundwater. Infiltration is when water goes through soil. So that process is going to continue from there. Okay, that is it for the biogeochemical cycles. Um, if you have any questions, definitely let me know. Also, make sure that you are taking a look at your textbook modules for this unit and your Quizlet um, practice flashcards for this unit as well.